minutes. Is that all right? We're just running this song now. We can start from there. Yeah, okay. But I, we're going to start on the dot rather than... Well, in that case, you said that when the song is over... Yeah, there you go. I started streaming. So, so we there we go. This is the uh, time till fourth day. So if you're going to be at fourth day, you've got to, got to start making your plans now. If you're going to present at fourth day, uh, some of us, you know, write our our uh, presentations for fourth day in the middle of fourth day, but uh, hopefully we're better prepared than that now. Uh, so there we were in San Francisco. We're not going to start for another minute or two. We've got to wait for some folks to come back, I guess. And San Francisco is kind of unique in that they're one of the last places where the fire department uses wooden ladders. And that is because there are all these electrical wires and things that are sort of unique to San Francisco. But uh, they actually have a wood shop that does nothing but maintain these wooden ladders. And associated with the wood shop is a training program. And it goes in two phases. So the young apprentice comes in and he learns how to make the basic ladders. Uh, and uh, then uh, they get another order for another batch of ladders. And it turns out that the apprentice gets told, well, you, you have to go home. You can't work on these. And the apprentice says, well, why? And uh, the guy... The, the master ladder maker says, we haven't had the extension class. Well, it was true right up until the, yeah. the second batch of ladders came in. Okay. It was all accurate right up until then. And, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Have so, you heard of, uh, did... Ladders. Did we know not not in San Francisco? Well, it's hard, it's hard to, wood. Are we uh, are we on the air? Do we have good audio and everything's happy? And everything. All right. Well, welcome to the Silicon Valley Fourth Interest Group September meeting. I'm Kevin Appert. I'm your program chair, and uh, we've got one uh, quickie little presentation we're going to try and squeeze in. Uh, Next month, coming next month, uh, is more preparation for fourth day, which is coming in November. So October is a good place to, you know, do your warm-up or practice or uh, talk to get started or get you in the mood for fourth day. So the other, another thing that's coming in, uh, in October is... This slideshow that isn't working. Okay, great. IQ test failure. <laughs> and this guy right here is our Grammy Award winning presenter. Uh, Jay McKnight's going to come hopefully in October and tell us about uh, the history of Ampex. And the thing that put us in the mood for this is that they tore down the uh, sign for uh, the Ampex uh, diamond. <laughs> yeah, that was that was years ago when they they found one and put it back up there down by the zoo. But we digress. Anyway, uh, they were tearing down the Ampex sign and putting it in the warehouse long, many, many years. It was a, a landmark along Highway 101 here in the Silicon Valley. So, anyway, without further ado, unless anybody have announcements, rumors, gossip, slander, libel? All right, Andres, it's all yours. Don't forget to tell them who you are before you get on with your spiel. You're going to need this mic that I've got. You want the pouch? Oh, it's got a clip. 
build spec battle harness. Uh, put that too. Silver. Audio. Hello. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, I am Chris Wagner, and I just have a little quick anecdote about writing the quadratic formula in fourth and how I did it with how it's done with just uh, stack jugglers versus how it's done with another way. It's less awkward, I think. So. Uh, with uh, conventional fourth, we embed push and pop in the front and end of a word, end of a code word, uh, implemented in assembly. Oops, it happened. Oh, there we go. It's going to come back on. Just a moment. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, in conventional fourth, we embed push and pop words in the front end of an of a assembly code word. And then we would juggle the parameters into place in our high level words. And after we've received them in the front of a word. And uh, that can be rather awkward sometimes to see all these stack jugglers everywhere. It gets better over time. It's still rather awkward. So uh, I thought, well, I should try something that's really, really awkward in fourth and see how that goes. And I thought, well, the quadratic formula, if you try implementing the quadratic formula in fourth, it doesn't look all that great. So this is uh, something I, I just pulled quadratic formula from Rosetta code. And this is what it looks like. It's kind of a bit confusing compared to infix. So uh, then I remembered uh, Sam Falvo had these. Sam Falvo had these. Uh, work. Sam Falvo, um, I think it was last month, and he showed uh, exposing push and pop words to high level force so that you can push and pop from the parameter stack from within the middle of, from within the middle of a word of a high level word definition and then you don't have to juggle them into place at the front of the word so uh, I like that but then I thought well how do I do it uh, interactively with interactively passed parameters without patching the machine code after the fact that was I wasn't trying to do that and then I thought well I could uh, I just um, use the FIFO fourth words. Uh, I just did this in FIFO fourth style. So I uh, fetch from the bottom of the stack, from the deepest element of the stack, and move it to the front. And so basically, I have the use the registers as if they were a stack, and the parameter, and I get parameters from the bottom of the parameter stack. And uh, that allows me to have words like like the return stack words for pushing and um, popping from the return stack, um, but for the parameter stack instead. And then this is what quadratic formula looks like in uh, this style. So it's a lot smaller, um, a, lot, a lot easier to read, I think. So uh, you just uh, if, um, a, b, c coefficients of the formula of the polynomial, and here you so you fetch like a you take a off the stack off of the bottom of the parameter stack, move it to the up here, then you uh, fetch b, you negate it, and uh, so on. So that's a lot easier to read, I think, than the stack juggler version. And uh, then I thought, well, could I go simpler and make the uh, 
push and pop words sort of bury them into primitive words somehow. And I just uh, thought, well, I could make make it non-destructive, make the words non-destructive by default, and then explicitly drop the parameters when I don't need them anymore. So this is what it looks like to do that. So I have, and I also sort of, uh, I rearrange the coefficients so that it's in the order that I actually use them in. Uh, so I just, uh, I use a B, I get rid of it, I use C, I get rid of it, then I use A, and then I get rid of A when I don't need that anymore. And so it's almost like a pattern matching type thing, and it doesn't really, it works with very deep stacks as well, without juggling, excessive juggling. So yeah, that's all. Any, um, any questions about that? So what you're saying is you have another stack, right? I use the same. I use the same parameter stack. I just use. Well, yeah, you, but you, but you, well, I meant you have a data stack, return stack, and then you have this parameter stack, right? The data stack and parameter stack. I just, I, I just call. It, I use the words interchangeably. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so the parameter stack is used as both FIFO and a stack. Okay. And when you're using it as a stack, when you want to use it as, when you want to get um, words, um, values into, so to speak, registers of the words. Yeah. Uh, then you use it as a stack. Otherwise, you use it as a FIFO and you fetch from the bottom, oh, okay. from the deepest element. Oh, okay. And you move it to the top when you need it. To use right. it in the, as registers. as right. effectively a register item. you like that better than using the return stack? Or like I, I do because uh, this way you can cross definitions. You can use this in interpretation state. You can use it outside of the colon definition. So... Uh, I think this, yeah, you can cross you can cross colon definitions and works outside of the outside of a uh, colon definition. So I think that's the advantage. Do you realize how expensive colon is? If you do it in a high level for like like how it's done here, it is expensive because it's actually moving everything. Yeah. Um, well, no matter how you've got to move everything. Yes, but if you do it, if I implement it in a bare metal fourth on like a on the piece of whoops on the piece sock um, five LP microcontroller. I just have I just have a consume and produce word, which just gets it from the other end of the. I don't actually move the data that way. It's oh, just sort of like a rolling. You're, you're moving the pointers. I'm moving the pointers when I do oh. it on bare metal. Okay. But this okay. is just a. Uh, okay. This is just a. A wrapper for G4, so you can just try it out in G4. I, I, I understand, and yeah, I put another stack in. <laughs> yeah, yeah stack I sort of put it in the middle. I put the parameters sort of like in the middle of the RAM, I and then it's just sort of like you. moves around. I hear you. Um, sort okay. of like wraps around mod the length of the RAM or something like okay. that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's efficient in bare metal, just not in. Yeah, uh, yeah. Not in G. Don't do this in G fourth if you want performance. Correct. Yeah. In, in, in any <laughs> traditional fourth, roll is. Uh, yeah. Don't touch roll. But on bare metal, this is just fine if you do it True. with pointers only. So yeah. And it's easier to read, I think. But yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, quadratic formula with uh, using uh, using uh, he just came uh, here. Uh, it's a quadratic formula using uh, the stack parameter stack as both a FIFO and as a stack, and you use it as a just to summarize. You use it as a uh, stack when you want to get values into so to speak registers mm -hmm. of the words in that are processing the items. And uh, use it as you fetch from the bottom of the parameter stack uh, to use like Sam Falvo's uh, parameter stack push and high level push and pop words, so that you don't need to patch the machine code if you want to have like d d from and d two or d fetch and d store, sort of like r from and r two. 
in our fetch in our store, but for the parameter stack instead of the return stack. And it works uh, across outside of colon definitions and across definitions as well, unlike the return stack where it's All right. So any, anything else or um, is the other person ready? By the um, would anyone be interested in if I interested in a talk on like resonant metamaterials, kind of fourth related? I don't know. If you're interested, I could probably give a talk. Anyone, anything else? Next person. Who is that? Uh, looks like Brad Nelson. Short break. Short break. Okay. okay. I don't know how to turn this off. What? Where are you on? So I assume you got my email. I did, yeah. Okay. I replied to it in the car this morning. Oh. <laughs> Question, Brad. Yes, we are running ahead of schedule at this time. All right. This is the stuff. This sucks. Okay. So, I think. Yeah, this is the Italian. So it's best for interest for everybody right. except the guy that says, oh, I'll tune in at 1 30 since I want to see Brad. Oh. There's so that. It's like it's on digitized. So this is just locked in the on position? Is that the, the new cleverness? It's just on. I take it we don't. Okay. Oh, that's not forbidden? Ooh. Oh, snazzy. It's the same. Aha. It's just got a clever new... Covering. That would. Mm. <laughs> all right. Should we get to it? Um, all right. I'm Brad. Um, here to talk again about dub 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 uh, basic. Uh, now with donkeys. So. Uh, for those of you who missed my last talk, um, uh, I was inspired by three times ago when uh, Ed Thelen came uh, and uh, talked about his uh, Nikki Hercules uh, simulator uh, that was uh, written in, uh, in BASIC of various sorts, uh, uh, most recently uh, running on free BASIC. Um, but of course, uh, I was off put by the fact that it, you know, on his, his, his website he puts it up there and well here's this executable and it's guaranteed to be virus free. <laughs> uh, so I thought well this is a shame we've got this program and uh, at the time I, I, uh, I was not in the mood to fire up a whole VM just to, just to run it uh, on, on uh, the Windows build he had and probably could have just gone ahead and gotten free base, but, you know, being the, the industrious sort I thought well let me do something about this so why not make it possible to run it on the web, um, and uh, in particular to compile it to JavaScript. Um, I, uh, I quickly hit upon the idea, of course, if you're going to compile the JavaScript, you should, should just do it sort of on the fly. 
um, because why not? And uh, and then uh, the other goal I sort of set for myself is I wanted to be able to run Ed's code as is, uh, because you know that the point you say, oh, I'm going to re-implement it, that's that's a never-ending thing. Um, and uh, this was appealing because this is sort of basic as a basic uh, is a is a nice scope problem, especially when you only need to one, run one program. Um, and I figured this might give me some some inspiration on approaches to my next web-based fourth. So. Uh, I got it running uh, last time um, and uh, actually met up with Ed later and uh, we, we sorted out a few, few of the other issues with it. Uh, there's some caveats to it. There's some uh, things with the help that are a little bit off uh, in terms of uh, text handling that I haven't circled back yet to fix, but the, the core uh, simulator runs and all of that. Um, so, so after last time, of course, then uh, then I uh, went ahead and open, I had open sourced it, um, having uh, Moved away from the Chrome team, where I could sort of wave hands and say, "Oh, this is just a, a you know, a web demo related to my job." I'm now over an assistant and thought, "Okay, I'll, I'll do the proper process." So we, op it's actually open sourced at uh, uh, Google's GitHub uh, site and all of that. Uh, it runs Ed's program and and a few samples, uh, but there's a lot more basic out there. So that was sort of the next, you know, thing to thing to explore. And uh, the, the next one on my list was uh, sort of uh, an oldie but a goodie. Uh, it's donkey.basic. It's, uh, you know, there's from the top of it. It's literally one of the demos that uh, came with the IBM PC. Um, and uh, for those of you unfamiliar with donkey, <laughs> this is donkey. <laughs> um, it's uh, it's not much of a game, but you know you push the space bar to move the uh, the car back and forth, and try not to hit the donkeys, or else they go splat. Um, so, um, what does this involve? Yeah, it was, it was a demo for this. It was apparently written uh, by Bill Gates himself, along with this other fellow, Neil Kunzman, who never heard of, but okay. Uh, apparently, they wrote it in a locked room, and I actually, uh, uh, and uh, in particular, this room was apparently uh, over 100 degrees inside, uh, so it wasn't very pleasant to be in there when they were doing it, so they probably were incentivized to get it, get it done fast. I had, apparently, the, the the underlying issue was that IBM had given them this hardware, and they were told, you know, don't uh, uh, it's it's to be in its own separate locked room with restricted access. I uh, I have an anecdote. I, a colleague of mine, uh, Bill Budge, uh, once upon a time had an early opportunity to join Microsoft and has some tale of being brought into a locked room to see an early IBM PC. I'm now kind of curious if this might be the very same locked room. <laughs> He didn't take the job, unfortunately, it sounds like. So, that, uh, well, anyhow. Um, yeah, well, he had, uh, he had apparently seen early Macs, and so he was like, <laughs> thinking, this thing's garbage. <laughs> why do I want to, <laughs> why do I want to go work for this company? Um, so, uh, so, a bunch of things had to happen to make uh, WWW basic uh, be able to run Donkey. Uh, first of all, line numbers. I hadn't needed it for Ed's program. His, uh, his free basic uh, supports labels. It also does support line numbers, but I hadn't implemented them, so that was an easy win. Um, it uses uh, data read and restore as a fun feature of basic. That's actually kind of one of its nicer ones. That there's a, an explicit way to, to list out chunks of data and pull them in, and so yeah, that was a thing to implement. Um, one really mysterious one I had never encountered, even in sort of other basic source code I'd seen is that, well, what's this this equal greater? Well, as it turns out, in uh, in basic, uh, you can just uh, do uh, that for greater than or equal to. And in a couple spots, for no particular reason in the source, they happen to do, do that instead, because why not? <laughs> um, there's a few places where it uses low-level code, where it sets, sets the current segment and then does some peaks and pokes. Um, there's this uh, draw operation. It's its own little mini language for drawing. Uh, there's, a, there's also a, a similar thing for playing uh, music, which uh, I'll, t I'll confess now that I have not yet gotten to sound. So uh, this is uh, happily just a, a no-op at the moment. Um, and then there's support for a blitting, uh, sort of getting a region of the screen into an array and, and, and uh, putting it back out. Um, there's paint and the flood fill. There's a uh, an interesting uh, mode that it uses for parts of the application, um, and uh, then there was the small issue that I had uh, previously been able to get away with um, uh, 
uh, some things with the font that caught up to me at the point of looking into this. We'll go through each of these. So, well, first I'll start with the code mysteries, the things that I didn't actually understand in the source code. So there was this little mystery line, what, what the heck does this do, poking to 106. Um, and uh, I, I uh, actually ha I have yet to find a reference anywhere that actually describes it directly, but I was able to find, um, so Donkey was one of several samples, and there was actually, um, there's actually code in uh, the application uh, premised under the idea that you would have gone into samples.bass, which is a menu, to let you pick one of several samples, and then those chain and then run, uh, run uh, the various samples. And so uh, you can see donkey here in the list. And uh, lo and behold, down here at the bottom is this uh, similar poke line. And it, what it turns out is that it clears the six uh, keyboard buffer. So they're apparently concerned that you, <laughs> you might have a key still in the buffer. So, And it's interesting because this sample, uh, both in here and uh, some of the other ones, they sort of incessantly do this for some reason. I guess they're <laughs> for keyboard issues unclear. Code mystery number two, um, this little thing here, it's in, uh, it's a def seg for those unacquainted, uh, sets the, uh, the, the segment uh, in x80, you know, uh, um, 8086 segments uh, that, uh, that basic will peek and poke to. By default it peeks and pokes in the, the, uh, the memory region for, ba for basic zone variables. Uh, zero is down, uh, down at the top and um, this particular one, uh, so this, this sort of, there's this here, uh, you know, it's reading from a location and then masking with 30 and, and then confirming that it does not equal 30. Um, if you look at it in context, it gives a hint as to what's going on here. Uh, it's, it, when this doesn't match, then it skips over all of this. Uh, but otherwise it says, hold it, you're not using CGA uh, monitor adapter because this particular program uses, uh, C, you know, screen one and, and CGA uh, four color mode. Um, and uh, what it is is that there's a, uh, the BIOS actually has a, uh, a region in which it keeps a bunch of uh, state. There's a, a BIOS uh, data area and uh, it happens to keep this particular set of flags. I have yet to find any documentation of what those flags are. Folks that say, this region of bytes, this is the bias data area with various fields, and one, this one is the flags field, but they don't say what the flags are. Apparently, <laughs> the, the, the three zero is, uh, is uh, uh, those flags are involved in indicating that there's a CGA card, so. Well, you know, as far as like BIOS code, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You probably find older uh, firmware mm -hmm. online that's a dump code. Mm -hmm. So you find out what those regions are. Yeah, I mean, you probably have to actually, do, do they have actual source with any, or is it, uh, it going to be sort of pieced through and just figure out what it, what, what it was doing to set those? And, oh, okay, that might be. Because I imagine they would have had to reverse engineer. Because if if even something as foundational as these samples is checking these bits, if they're you know if you if you happen to have the wrong uh, whatever, the way I of course worked around it and the previous one is to make poke a no op for now and to make peak. Uh, this one, fortunately, if you if peak returns zero all the time, then you you uh, you, uh, you you pass the condition in the right direction, and so you you eek by and it thinks you have a CGA card. So lucky lucky accident. Um, so, but uh, in any event, um, so draw is a, a fascinating little mini language. These are common, uh, sort of in the basics of the area era, this sort of thing where you have a little mini language with uh, drawing commands because it's very memory dense. So you have uh, things like, um, uh, you know, sort of up some number, down some number uh, to, to draw, and you can pack very densely a, a description of an image. Um, you set color, set, you know, move, move to position, uh, and, and then even scale and rotate the image, potentially, uh, and then various prefixes to indicate that you want to stop drawing or to, 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 uh, to move back afterwards if you wanted to do like a star pattern or something. Um, and so what you end up with is, you know, something, something like this uh, with a bunch of fairly dense drawing commands turns into that. <laughs> so, um, and uh, so then another uh, interesting one is uh, paint. So there's this uh, flood fill operation uh, paint where you give it a position and then attribute an optional border and background. And um, the, um, uh, 
the interesting thing about this paint operation is it's not quite like the flood fill in MS Paint um, because it's uh, where the flood fill in MS Paint sort of reads the location that it's at, stays within the color uh, that you're currently on. With this flood fill, uh, it is looking for a certain border cut color and it's filling everything in between. And so if you have uh, a region uh, of you know two different colors and then some border around them, you just fit, cover both without regard to it. Um, there's um, later versions uh, the uh, end up supporting patterns. If you pass strings in for these, you can do uh, various uh, uh, packed patterns. But in uh, as of like the, the very first version of PC Basic, that's not supported. Um, this one's quirky to implement these days because where historically it was very common to do flood fills because it was this thing you could do in place in the memory in, in a display buffer. Uh, you know, things like on the web, you don't typically have that kind of an operation because that's uh, sort of a read-write operation and, and is, is sort of not conducive to modern hardware. So I had to go and implement this uh, in, my, in my data buffer. I actually changed around quite a bit of how uh, I was doing graphics. I previously had been drawing directly into a canvas. Instead, I uh, moved all of the operations to, to, uh, to do uh, raw raster operations in a, in, a, in a memory buffer because I wanted to be able to do an efficient flood fill. If you do it pixel by pixel on a canvas, it'll be extremely slow. Probably would have been fine for Donkey, but thought, well, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. And actually, one there actually is one reason that why um, why it was problematic for Donkey. Um, there's a strange choice in which um, uh, for for the uh, the car uh, in the game, rather than filling in the interior of the car, because there are lots of little sections inside. Uh, they draw the outlines of the car and then flood fill the entire uh, the entire outside and then use that uh, and then use the inverse uh, when plotting uh, in order to to uh, to fill because it was easier to have if you've got a bunch of disjoint regions you'd have to flood fill each of them separately and then uh, it's easier to fill the outside and then subtract away so. Uh, and, and if you're filling the entire screen, that's a lot of pixels to be reading back and forth, and Canvas is not very fast uh, to do that. Um, so with that, you can end up having a paint operation, and you can fill in your donkey. Um, so um, another uh, thing, of course, is that uh, it uses get and put because on these CGA cards, it was you know extremely slow if you didn't have a, a machine lang machine language operation to actually read and write these pixels. The draw operation is slow enough that if you're, you know, it's, it's almost at the speed you can see it draw. So on an actual CGA card, um, get and put are a good bit faster. They're sort of blitting. You have, a, you have an array. You get from some region. It fills it into the buffer. Um, and, then, uh, and then you put it back somewhere else. And you, you have a choice of what, uh, what kind of a, a, an operation you want to do if you want to XOR it and it, that sort of thing. Um, there was one weird, weird gotcha in here. The 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 documentation for uh, for basic doesn't precisely describe the format in which uh, the uh, the data is actually written into um, the memory. It, it's it states some things about. Uh, how to calculate the size of the area that will be used, because you need to know how large of an array to allocate. Um, but it doesn't actually pres prescribe exactly the format. Um, and so unfortunately, I had to dig into uh, what that format is, because there's one spot in uh, Donkey in which it, uh, rather than uh, getting the uh, drawing something, getting it, and then later putting it, uh, they just create a, uh, an array and fill it in with data that's presumably in the correct format. Um, it turns out it's you know couple, couple it's the width and height and then in, uh, width actually weirdly width times four uh, and then uh, the the um, presumably it's the because it's the number of bit bit strides and then the um, uh, and then it's uh, it's sixteen bits at a time but like uh, but it's little endian so it's kind of it's kind of a little bit goofy um, and I had to duplicate that precisely. What it turns out they're drawing with this particular operation is if you see this, uh, the, the, the uh, road lines down the middle, um, initially it goes and draws each of those. And then uh, this, uh, this uh, region that it's getting and putting is just a giant two pixel wide uh, stripe down the middle. And it's XORing it. And so uh, it's just toggling the two. And so. <laughs> 
Yeah. And they're doing that because that's a whole lot faster than going back through and doing line for each of them. The, the fascinating one here is, to me, visually, until that had been pointed out, I hadn't realized that there were only the two states. I was sort of I was like, oh, it's moving. No, it's not really moving. It's just <laughs> toggle, toggle, toggle. So um, so let's see. Another another fun one. There's this uh, rarely used little known mode. Well, I don't know. It's probably used. It's more than, more than uh, it's somewhat used. Uh, there's a 40-column text mode on uh, on uh, <laughs> uh, PCs, and uh, likely because uh, with the with the first PC, there were there were all kinds of situations where you uh, you you uh, you might want to uh, have something look bigger. The title screen for Donkey and several of these other uh, samples were done uh, with the forty column text mode instead. So that was a mode I hadn't implemented initially. Um, the uh, line art. What do I mean by line art? Oh. Yeah. Ah, yeah, liner. So, um, so yeah, it's this other text mode, and so that had to be taken into account. Um, it's used for the title screen. You'll see in a moment when I bring up Donkey. Um, the the other issue is that previously for a font, what I had been doing was using. Um, I had been using because I was drawing into Canvas. I was simply using built-in uh, built-in fonts, and uh, I, I was not uh, using a font that was a good fit for. Uh, Having all these extended line drawing, and as it happens, the title screen uses the full uh, character set. Not the full character set, as you'll see. I so I ended up keying in my own version of uh, the font. I didn't copy it exactly, just because well, I wanted to be. I, th I always enjoy doing little little eight by eight fonts for various reasons. And, um, the uh, so, but I did enough of the characters to to uh, for the for this particular title screen. Um, and then uh, an interesting hap thing happened. Uh, the the project got discovered by the press. Um, so on September 16th, uh, it made Hacker News. Uh, a bunch of folks discussing it, and, and you know, sort of nostalgia and oh, whatnot with Basic. Um, lots of flurry of activity. Uh, a few days later, uh, Boing Boing, Boing had, had an article, and they. Uh, said sort of various interesting things to say. Hackaday <laughs> discovers it and sort of, okay, here's this thing. It's the web, basically. <laughs> um, and uh, possibly caused by or in tandem with, uh, suddenly my, uh, my uh, project of one on GitHub uh, got a flurry of folks uh, expressing interest in filing issues. And so uh, the open source community shows up. Um, <laughs> oh, what is this now? Um, there are some of them, there's a project going on, there's a thing called QB64. There's some folks that are working on a 64-bit a uh, quick basic, and they have various varying levels of compatibility. Their, their goal is for native systems. So this is sort of um, related, but, but not directly tied to their effort. Um, and so they've, a number of them sort of popped up. Um, a bunch of them, of course, are interested in the quick basic era uh, of, uh, of applications, and, and, and particularly Gorilla and, and, and Nibbles. Gorilla was one I, I had remembered from that era, and that was sort of next to my list. Um, Nibbles, I, I guess it was part of the same set of demos with it, but I don't particularly remember it. It's a, one of these snake snake games and a similar kind of a thing. Um, it might actually be a better starting point because it's a slightly smaller and simpler application. Gorillas, Gorillas does all the things. It's got, you know, the Gorillas throwing bananas at buildings and things. Um, so I've had a bunch of outside, I've had 12 outside pull requests, uh, and uh, I've got seven team members now on the thing. <laughs> So, of varying varying levels of you know sort of background and skills, um, a lot of it is just little fixes. They found things with like uh, you know the color the color com uh, command. I had done some things wrong. I had done something wrong with clear screen. Some fix uh, a bunch of great ideas for sort of places for improvement. Um, this has led to sort of interesting questions around logistics with GitHub. One of the things is that um, I you know I worked for years on Chromium and and there we had a 
very particular set of practices in terms of uh, you know squashing commits and things like this. But on GitHub, there's there's this kind of the GitHub way of doing things, and you confuse folks if you kind of run against that. So we've already had a little you know sort of poll and community discussion around well, do we want to do merges or do we want to do squashes or rebasing and all of that, which I didn't anticipate that conversation. Uh, fairly early on, somebody's like, have you grabbed the npm package name? You got to reserve that name so that somebody doesn't doesn't name squat that from under you. So now we have an npm package for it. Um, <laughs> there, uh, there's a there's a, 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 go, a thread going on because of course any good project needs a logo. Um, uh, node package manager. I'll go into detail on that one in a sec. Um, and then and folks, of course, are like, well, you need a live editor for this thing. So the uh, the Node package manager is the the package manager uh, that Node.js uses. Node is a, a cert, cert, you know command line server side uh, uh, JS library. It um, it's sort of the done way to like uh, deal with dependencies between applications and, and packages, and it makes it uh, very easy to to uh, glue together pieces of JS that are dependent. You have a manifest describing the project, and they happily sent me a pull request with with my you know my name and email. Here's what you you need to fill out and submit to do the thing, and and uh, and and you know go do it quick before somebody grabs the name. <laughs> Uh, and it makes it as simple to, to install it as a dependency into your project this, w this way. I had this sort of, the, 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 uh, the application happens to live uh, in, a, in a single JS file at the moment, but this would allow for a world in which it grows into this you know, voluminous, complicated thing. Um, so that's nice. Um, there's a thread going on on, on a logo. I, I admit that uh, my prior interaction with WebAssembly made me think, well, that'll be a good way to give people a, a way to engage with the project, regardless of their technical level of expertise. And and as it happens, if you ask, you shall receive. So I said, oh, well, maybe do, do we do we want to have a logo? And well, of course, they do the the uh, the obvious thing of um, if you're unfamiliar, the JavaScript, the official JavaScript logo is looks exactly like this, but says JS. So of course, somebody says that. They, uh, somebody proposed, oh no, it needs to look like a NASA-like thing, or like this. There's a, th this one is, I think, the, the sort of leading favorite, this, the style with the dub, dub, dub basic. Um, and it, he's even got, got a whole presentation of how we could revamp the site. To <laughs> um, there's the, there's the, this sort of thing. Uh, that, one's cool. that one's cool, yeah. Um, Another really great suggestion is somebody's like, well, you should plug this into uh, the ACE editor. So uh, somebody says, oh, has anybody added uh, the, you know, uh, the, the ACE editor? Uh, ACE is this, uh, this uh, uh, editor for a thing called Cloud9. This is a web-based IDE. Um, and uh, as I knew that interactivity had been key to uh, Haiku for success, I thought, OK, well, let's, let's, let's plug that in. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it doesn't. It, it, so it's this elaborate uh, editor with syntax files for different languages. It doesn't yet have a basic syntax file, which I'm hopeful that one of my uh, my open source contributors will go and produce. But it has Fortran, which is pretty close. So that's what I plugged in for now. So you're able to go to a, an editor on a web page like this and push the run button, and then out comes something like that. And I'll, I'll show that. <laughs> In a minute, and uh, so you know, suddenly a flurry of activity. What's next? Better documentation. There's a couple of folks that have specifically said, "I want to make the documentation better." I'm going <laughs> to and asking me all kinds of questions about that. Better tests. The the I only about maybe halfway through bringing up Ed's thing realized, you know, this is not just a little toy. I need to have some tests for it. And so ha about half of the language constructs have tests, and the other half don't. And but it's been getting better. Uh, everybody seems to want QBasic Compat because, of course, they all want gorillas and all of that. So um, uh, the biggest blocker there is actually uh, it's quite a lot more work to support functions and nesting. Ed's, pro uh, Ed's uh, simulator, by the way, is an interesting program because it used GoSub. It used a lot of sort of you know very very new features from FreeBasic, but it didn't use functions at all. Uh, and so that was. Uh, yeah, well, I've got most of the plot. There were, I kind of did it with an eye to that, so it's not as far. But it, there's and there's a branch where I've got it halfway working. But um, types actually are already kind of working. You can already declare types as long as they. I, the one caveat is there's some constraints around strings that are goofy. I haven't. I need to re restructure the way I do strings to to make it mesh better with types. Um, and then of course, you know, gorillas and nibbles will be the the obvious next milestones for the project. Along with whatever the community dreams up, so let's um, yeah let's let's go over to the to the site. So as you can see, I've got you know a whole bunch of 
Now I've got an active set of, uh, of uh, you know, I've got two pull, pull requests I got to refer to. Somebody's implementing on GoTo because I had gotten away without doing that. A uh, bunch of different op open issues. Um, so uh, let's see. So of course now we got to first show Donkey because because Donkey. So here's here's Donkey and the, that title screen that uh, caused all that trouble. You hit the space bar and if you can very carefully avoid hitting the Donkey, oh, well, and then you <laughs> you get squished. Um, so that's Donkey. Um, the um, the other uh, the other fun thing, of course, is this this new editor. Um, so actually, let me zoom that in so folks can see. Um, but basically, you can uh, dynamically change things around. So let's say this is in a a text mode, but let's say we go into a graphics mode. And then we'll do line uh, i times 100, i times 20 to, I don't know, let's say i times 120, i times 10, um, something like that. You run it, and then you can do things live and have the program change and draw lines, whatnot. And, uh, uh, all, all the various syntax, you know, sort of does, works there, and, and uh, you can interact with it. So that's been, uh, that's been great fun. Uh, are there any questions? What's that? Indeed. Um, yeah, no, of course, this is the, the sudden flurry of interest has been fascinating in the sense that now I get pull requests at various times of the times of the day. I, I don't know if this ultimately distracts from my actual goal of getting back to uh, to uh, using this as inspiration for fourth. But for now, I mean, they're, you know, I, I've been meaning to try to get gorillas to run anyways, and it's ever so close. So. <laughs> Ah, yes, clearly. <laughs> that, that. And then we can create nostalgic games for work. Indeed, indeed. It, it is interesting with basic, the, uh, you, you, so the, the folks that have shown up, there's, you know, kind of a broad range of, of experience levels with, with Git and otherwise. And, and I think it's because, you know, basic has this even broader built in community and sort of particular nostalgia around it. So it's, it's kind of, kind of fascinating. And it's, it, it also, I think, for, you know, I, re I remember, I I'm old enough to remember Donkey, but like, you know, Gorillas and whatnot was the entry point for folks for whom their first basic was QBasic. I'm sure for folks that, and actually my, my first one goes back to the TI-99, so that's, you know. Um, and, and I'll confess now that one of my, on the back of my mind, like I remember some of the old key in programs for the TI-99, and I'm thinking, oh, I should add the add support for that. The, you know, it's uh, built in uh, graphics and whatnot, and drag mm -hmm. out some of those, but. Um, of course, we live in a world in which there's all sorts of emulators now for these old systems. So if you want that full fidelity experience, that's the way to go. But, the, but it, there is something kind of fun about in, uh, having it just there on the page. I don't. For those of you who missed the prior talk, one of the um, one of the things that's that's uh, neat about uh, the way this is done is that a program like this uh, just is um, is structured so that. Um, the um, oops, so that the if you look at the the actual source of the um, wait, why am I getting the ah. um, if you actually just look, the the uh, the source of the page the basic code is just put in line on the page and so you're not having to. Uh, you're not having to, you're able to just, here's my HTML page, a little bit of boilerplate at the top, and then there's basic code. So there isn't the sort of, the extra step of, I'm running in an emulator in the system. It's just, here's the basic code uh, in line, uh, or, or a source tag that references a .bass file, and, and it goes to town. It, uh, it compiles rather than interprets, so that's another weird impedance mismatch with assumptions of some of these. Uh, so it goes through, converts it to JS underneath, and then runs that JS. Because for Ed's program, it actually needed the performance difference. So for Donkey, it wouldn't have mattered. But. 
Yes, and in fact, actually, you, you, actually, that was something I didn't mention. Um, specifically, so that Donkey uh, would run at something approximating uh, a valid speed, what I ended up doing is uh, there's a little heuristic uh, that assumes that if you, uh, you go some number of hops uh, without having uh, drawn, that that might be the end of a frame, so that it knows how long to pause in between. And so... Uh, that way I'm able dynamically for Ed's program to know that I'm going to have to uh, crank really hard and do lots of operations per uh, at a fast rate. Whereas for Donkey, I need to let it pause, let, let's wait for the next frame. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure it's a perfect heuristic there. I, you know, I haven't exactly clocked it, but I think uh, my Donkey runs maybe slightly slower than the original. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's, uh, if you wanted full fidelity, you would obviously have to have to emulate all the things or carefully match it. Close enough. <laughs> all right. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Oh, that went really fast. Yep. Oh, okay, that's good. And a good job it was. So, uh, before we break, I'd like to ask folks uh, how they feel about Chuck's Euro formal, Euro fourth talk. I'm not sure how long it is.
three screen donuts. Um, that's that was my expectation. So don't hold this. Just clip it to your shirt. Uh, Don Golding, and um, I'm here to present um, how I use Forth, um, creating an artificial intelligence kind of OS to uh, run intelligent robotics. <clears throat> this little robot here, uh, we sold about 2,000 of them in the 1990s, for pretty much over the 10 years from 91 to 2001. Mostly in education is where they wound up. I did build some robots that, <clears throat> for the military and some other things, we'll, we'll take a look at the pictures. But what I want to demonstrate to you is the multitasking um, uh, OS that we're doing. It's, it's called, uh, I call it the triune OS. So the singing that you hear is the goal level. So the, so the goal level isn't even part of doing collision avoidance. And you notice there's just a tiny, tiny warble. So you, the goal level has 95% of the processor's power. This is an 8-bit microprocessor um, with 64K of space, 32K of RAM, and 32K of PROM. Our whole system fit on 32K of PROM. Now, if I touch his sensor, which is his, his whisker, you notice that the goal level's still running. That's your outer loop, right? But he's doing collision avoidance automatically in real time. <laughs> Let me do that again. He just got pissed off. So we can see that at the instinct level, it doesn't take any CPU cycles, essentially, um, to do uh, intelligent collision avoidance. Now, if I press the other whisker, all right. Settle down there, guy. Okay, I'm going to press this whisker, then this one. Okay, now that was a behavior. So what we have is we have a combination of preemptive time slice multitasking plus cooperative multitasking between the goal level and the behavior. So what you wind up doing, you don't program a whiskers. You create a behaviors for whiskers. Whenever you see a combination of sensors and the robot gets stuck, say in collision avoidance, you decide, okay, um, if in that situation when there's those sensor sensors that are activated, I, what I really want to do is this behavior, and then you put it in the task list, which is prioritized, and now the robot makes the decision when it comes into... Um, you know, the problem. So, <clears throat> let me just let him, can you uh, video him on the floor? So you notice he's singing his song, he's avoiding things, touches other whisker. Now that is a behavior I call frustration. And what's funny is, when I made that behavior, I was fooling around, and everybody loves frustration. But the, um, <laughs> okay, so this is actually, I need a behavior for this. This is a failure mode right there. He got his whiskers stuck. But look what happened. He got frustrated. The frustration behavior, I just have him wiggle back and forth, and it actually is useful for getting out of, <laughs> yeah, this is, that's a pretty tough problem. So I also measure the current in the motors. So if I grab a wheel, he senses it and he reacts to it. He has a behavior for that and has a behavior for that one, a different one. So his whole body is a sensor of last resort. He also has optical sensors. So they can see about six to eight inches away. You program it over a serial port and you use English. So 10 feet, so you say 10 feet forward or forward 10 feet stop is actual code. 
I was trying to make uh, a voice recognition front end language, so I wanted to use English as much as possible on the robot. <clears throat> so these are some of the robots I built. This is Advanced Whiskers. This is actually a military robot. Um, iRobot came out with a robot called the PackBot, and they were the first? Nope. <laughs> In 1987, I went to a technology roundtable with NASA, and I met a Colonel John Blitch with U.S. Special Forces. He had $80,000 grant from the Army AI Laboratory to build man-packable robots. In other words, to, to do some research to see if man-packable robots would be useful for the military. And he met me, and now iRobot, even in 97, 98, they were getting million dollar research deals. So they had zero interest in someone with 80 grand. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I said, yeah, I'll work with you. And so we actually built the very first man packable robot for US Special Forces. <clears throat> um, and that was this one here. The, the military guys nicknamed him Goldie because he's gold anodized. But he's four wheel drive. The wheels are somewhat articulated, and he could flip over. It, they wanted it invertible. He has a video camera in the front here. And then after they did research and they proved the concept of a small man packable robot, um, I actually designed this robot, which is called Intruder, which I do have a video. If we have time, we can watch the video of this thing in action. Um, this is MR1. This is the idea behind uh, the Triune OS is use distributed uh, processing. So you have one processor managing the base, one in the head, one in the arm. You network them all together so you get a real, real time system. <clears throat> so this is kind of a research robot. I was hoping to sell them into universities, but I never sold one of them. I just, I own one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So, you know, some of the applications we're looking at at the time, healthcare, industrial material delivery robots, commercial security, hazardous waste cleanup, search and rescue. Um, I actually built a robot for um, uh, the Hanford Nuclear Facility up in Washington. And I got the purchase order, $45,000. I built a robot. It had to go from... Um, six inches off the ground to seven feet high. It had to operate in seven rad, not millirad, seven rad environment. Uh, they had a storage facility with racks and they had little vials and th they needed a video camera to read the vials. <clears throat> so it had, I used the, idea, the same concept as a uh, forklift and for the camera. And so it could go six inches off the ground to seven feet in, in the air using the same concept. No, it was a, like a forklift. You know how forklifts extend? I used this. Right. Uh, we built the robot. We were, I was working on the software. They were getting impatient. They canceled the order. <laughs> so I still have that one. <laughs> but um, yeah, they were pretty serious about it. They were looking at all the other robots on the market, and none of them met the spec. But I, so I don't know what they did. <clears throat> I don't know. We never delivered the robot. <laughs> so. Usually it's a rat hardened. You need special, all the memories and all the chips have to be radiation hardened. Right. Yeah, well, we'd probably put some lead around it or something. Anyway, um, <laughs> so. <clears throat> So it, it, the funny story was, I really discovered this. I was solving a problem, and when I originally built a robot, uh, I just had two levels. I had the goal level, um, the foreground task, and then I had the background task. And I found that the robot would get stuck, and I decided I needed this arbitrator in the middle that I created the, be the behavior task. 
So what it is, I have a, uh, an ISR running at about 100 hertz, and the ISR goes in, in <clears throat> and works all of the sensors, like the LED sensors, for example. It turns the LED on, stores that value in a register, turn the LED off, store that value in another register, then it, then it subtracts the two to give me a delta. <clears throat> well, actually, it turns, it, on, it turns the LED off, stores the value, turns it on, stores the value, and then it, it creates the delta. And that delta is really the vision, what it's seeing, right? So <clears throat> then I have a, a fourth register, which I call the trigger level. And so whatever the hysteresis is, you'd set it to whatever you wanted. And then the fifth register is really just a flag. So send me four because everything is asynchronous, right? <clears throat> so all the flags and all the data for the registers, the motor, uh, motor current and everything was stored in all these registers, first thing in the ISR. The last thing the ISR did was it made a call to my task list and then it just runs through my task list. So the front first part of the task list are tasks. In other words, you want them to execute all the time. The second part of the task list are behaviors, which are always, if this condition exists, you execute this behavior. That's how I do the cooperative multitasking between the goal level and the, um, and the background. Um, so I created all that because I, I just solving a problem. I had no idea that there was a biological association. <laughs> and I was at a trade show and I was uh, describing this to um, you know someone like like you, and they uh, they said, "Oh, that's the triune brain." I said, "Well, what's that?" <laughs> and then they went on to explain how you know we have the the our um, our nervous system, and we got the limbic system, and then the cerebral cortex, and how they all interact. And I went, "Oh, that's my OS." <laughs> so I started calling it the triune OS after that. And um, <clears throat> the funny thing there is in 94, I gave a, a talk at JPL to their top roboticists, uh, Homin Siraji, if anyone knows, he was a direct, he was in charge of the group at the time. And I talked to him about the three-level architecture. I had all the top guy, all the guys that did the rover and, and that stuff in, in the room. And Homin Siraji was looking at me with big, big eyes, big saucers, you know. Because there were some researchers in the robotics community that was working on a three-level architecture and, you know, didn't really get it working. And here I was doing it on an 8-bit micro using fourth. <laughs> and um, so about 18 months later, they came out with 3T. Now, 3T was the same algorithm, you might say, that, but it was made really complicated. I mean, you needed a 386 and above to run it. And most of the autonomous, autonomous cars and things today are using JPL. They started with JPL 3T and went on from there. So, yeah, I got a software copyright, but, you know, good luck suing JPL. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so... This is basically how it works. Um, this is this is uh, foreground task, and this is you know background task down here. So you can see the instinct level. You got motor sensor fusion at this level. How I just described it. So it sets, it acquires information, it does some pre-processing, and um, sets registers that then the goal level and the task uh, behavior level can can. Um, evaluate and do whatever they're going to do. <clears throat> so like I said, tasks are in the first part of the list. It means they execute every time. And then behaviors are at the bottom of the list. And you prioritize them. So I have a word called priority. If you say one priority, it pushes the first thing on the list down to the second. And you stuff it in there. you know. And then uh, you could say delete task number three. So a task can actually reload the entire task list if it wanted to and restore it when it's done. So there's a lot of capability <clears throat> doing it that way. 
Um, so an interesting thing about, <coughs> about using this kind of reactive mode is you have the left-hand rule for sol solving a maze. So it's absolute trivial to make a whiskers robot solve a maze. You basically just make one motor a little bit faster than the other, and then the whisker would keep nudging it off the wall. So it would basically solve any maze with no, literally no code. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go on to something new here. Let's see. Um, so our most popular now this is a, a original version. Um, I had a clear top so the kids could see it. My biggest market was actually in um, middle school, high school technology labs. So we built a curriculum in 10 hours time, kids using this robot um, would learn basic programming. They'd learn about loops, they'd learn about constants and variables, and they would, in 10 hours, they would learn the basics of programming using a very fun machine. And it was very popular. We had the number two and number three largest distributors in education, which is um, Labbolt and Paxton Patterson were selling our, our uh, robots, and they sold about over t almost 2,000 of them in 10 years. So I was doing a little calculation. That's about 24,000 students per year. Uh, we're actually cutting their teeth on programming using fourth, because fourth was exposed. I mean, I didn't hide it. <laughs> uh, when you see the code, it says colon space, you know, my routine. The kids are learning this colon space you know, my routine, and then, uh, you know, go forward 10 feet, and I gave them the whole fourth, all the fourth words are available, so they could go as deep as they wanted, and then they could add it to the task list and see this new behavior that they created, which is a lot of fun for them. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so in the 1990s, this is one of the more, more popular uh, technology labs. Um, so 24,000 times maybe six or seven years, that's quite a few students. Yeah. Cut their teeth on fourth, didn't know it, but. Now you could build pretty much any robot with this, <clears throat> doing it this way. Um, got an order from a, uh, Science Museum in Georgia, and what they wanted was, see this track down here? They wanted to be able to put a track on the floor and change it any way they wanted, and then on one side of the track is a conveyor belt, and it would drop a box. This is actually a conveyor, so um, there's a light sensor. When the box hits it, it would pull the box onto the top, and then the robot would, once the box is pulled onto the top, would take off, go to the other end, and then dump the box, and then come back again. So I used one whiskers controller for that. That was a real uh, application. Um, we only sold one. <laughs> one doesn't make a company, but it worked really well, and they really liked it. It was a science museum. <clears throat> uh, Yeah, and you just you just put the tape any way you want, and it would follow it. And it was trivial coding. I mean, it was a few lines of code. It really was nothing. Because once you have the, the architecture down, it makes it so simple to make real-world uh, robots. This was... Now, Piper was a real application. So this is a pipe inspection company. There's a video camera in here, and these are actually lights. <clears throat> and what Piper would do, the head would go back and forth like this, and it would scan the inside of a pipe looking for defects. And it had a 500-foot uh, cord on it. And you could actually, uh, they had some heavy wire on it, so they could ink it out if it got stuck. And that was a real-world application. Sold one. <laughs> uh, it's, 
Yeah. Well, it's it's inside of a pipe, yes, yes. so like uh, probably an 18-inch pipe, and so it's all-wheel drive, so it could go up a pretty good angle, and um, yeah. Let's see. Intruder was kind of my favorite robot. And I can show you a video, but I'll, I'll do it at the end. So if you wanted to cut the video short, um, you can. After building the first military robot, Goldie, um, I wanted to, do, you know, obviously uh, I had ideas on, okay, how do you build robot that goes over grass and snow and everything else. So think of this. So think you have a tube and you take a coffee can, put it on each side, you drive it independently with a motor, it's an all surface drive. So there's only a tiny bit of space between the wheels. You know, it's actually uh, about an inch, but the treads are more than an inch tall. So if you had a rock, you know, that was an inch and a half, or, you know, then it would just go over it. <clears throat> um, it's all wheel drive, and it also articulated like this, which you would see in the video. The military really liked this one. In fact, they, they ordered, they were in the process of giving me a purchase order for 10 of them, which we, were, we had a list price of 25000 for this. So a quarter million dollar order during the Kosovo War. And in the process of getting the PO, they stopped the war. So they didn't, I never got the PO. <laughs> but <clears throat> there's a company called Suma Technologies in, uh, in, uh, where, uh, in Georgia. And they were making, they actually paid for my plane flight out. They wanted to actually distribute this to the military. And I flew out there, and they were making the side panels for the, um, the space station. And they had this biggest frickin' milling machine I've ever seen. It was a three-story mill, and it would take a slab of aluminum. It was 60 feet long and 12 feet wide, I'm going to say. I, I forget the length or the width. And it weighed like 6,000 pounds, solid piece of aluminum. It would mill out honeycombs, and when it was done, they had 5,500 pounds of scrap, and they had a 450-pound, you know, panel out of <laughs> that was originally solid aluminum, and uh, it was amazing. I wish I had a picture of that thing. The, I'm sure the, the the recycle guy was really happy with all the aluminum chips <laughs> from that company. But anyway, they were they wanted to um, actually sell it to the military and. We, uh, we had a, a, quite a bit of interest. Um, we actually went to Fort Benning, and by this time, iRobot had their PackBot, and <clears throat> they were doing a test. And, you know, my robot is all CMOS, and it's a, you know, little 8-bit microprocessor. So one of the tests was at night, they were using IR vision system, and the PackBot just lit up like a Christmas tree. And this guy was black because, you know, it's CMOS. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I, of course, I use, uh, you know, H-Bridge FAT, so it's a really efficient motor drive. And they were really like that, that part. Now, of course, who do you think was more politically, you know, set up for dealing with the military? iRobot, right? <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> yeah, anyway, so that was a good robot. So what I kind of want to do is show you code. Um, first, I want to talk about. <clears throat> so the instinct, instinct layer is the highest priority, but it's the dumbest. It just reacts. So instinct, pressure your, your hand on a hot plate. Your nervous system pulls your arm away. Then your brain you know, sends a signal to your brain, pain. And then you start thinking about it. Maybe you have a behavior, right? You're waving your, <laughs> your finger. 
so anyway, um, this is the, the architecture. So instincts are the highest priority, least intelligence. Tasks and behaviors are medium priority uh, and medium intelligence. They typically are doing simple things, but <clears throat> with this architecture, you are not writing a program to solve a problem. You are, it's like teaching a child. If you're in this situation, you do this thing, right? It's like teaching a child. Now the robot's making the decision, not the programmer. That's the whole point. I want the robot to make the decision. And the more behaviors you give it, the smarter it is. Every time it fails at doing something, you add a new behavior for whatever that failure mode was. And now you made the robot smarter. <clears throat> So the outer level, which is really your foreground task, <clears throat> and you know that's your that's your. Oh, by the way, this all works. You know, um, you're using a terminal to talk to it, and you see an okay. You can you can be um, you know colon at a colon definition while the instinct level is running, because it's all um, all done in the background. So fourth fourth is really the goal level, right? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> So the outer, the outer layer, um, or the goal level, is the least, least priority and is the highest intelligence. In other words, the goal, the goal level, because, because the instincts and behaviors can get, you, get across the room, all the goal level has to do is the door is over at 349 degrees. And as it's going, say, down here and avoiding things, now it's at three, uh, you know, 320 degrees. And then it sees it as okay. Make a make a right turn. So the goal level can is really simple to write because the robot is doing all the collision avoidance, the the three level architecture. <clears throat> and the funny thing is, after I finish this, you know, I do lots of embedded systems. I even write code in C, and this influenced me. And I always have like a hundred hertz task and I'm I'm at least using two you know two of the the three levels the instinct and the goal um, and then sometimes if you know I if I need uh, you know tasks then I'll add the the, the middle level but it also is is you just call the function right you just call the the task function uh, from the ISR that's all you do so this architecture, actually, you can do it. It's so so simple and so little code. You know, I just explained it to you. You guys can all go home and do it because <laughs> it's it's really easy. <clears throat> um, remember, I, I talked about the instinct level. So the key to the system is the instinct level basically has a bunch of semaphores, a bunch of flags, right? Um, shared registers. So here's an example. So left front trigger, um, that is, that's an 8-bit register. <clears throat> so it's either high or low. Um, and here's the left side front. So left side front left front, right front. Um, we got the left motor trigger and the right motor trigger. So what you do is you set those trigger levels and whenever the, the actual um, signal is above that trigger level, it does an over motor ride and then you have a register for whatever the motor mask is. In other words, if you want it to turn, if the right sensor sees something, you want to turn left if you're coll collision avoidance. Let's say you want to do attack mode. You simply change the register to go this way. <laughs> and, you, and the forward-looking registers want to drive forward when it sees something. So now you build an attack robot just by changing some simple values. You didn't write any code. <clears throat> Um, and so this is the actual, you know, you guys are fourth, so you know what 30 does. And then this is the, this is the, uh, uh, the sensor and then set, you know what that is? C store, right? I just renamed it, <laughs> but 
you know, to, to a kid or to a, an average user, you know, that's, that's English, right? And the goal was to make it English-like so I could have a voice recognition front end, which I was playing with. Remember, uh, oh, I forget the name of it, Box or something. <clears throat> You mean logo? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So <clears throat> these are simply defined, you know, as the bit patterns to control the motor. Uh, so the the motor registers, you know, is what is the bit pattern that goes to the motors to make them do the different things. So yet yeah, left forward, left. Rear, right, forward, right, rear, forward, right, reverse, stop, and then pivot, uh, pivot left and pivot right. So <clears throat> um, these are the actual commands you would use. So you would say, you know, like I showed before, you know, PVL, and then the the name of the register set, and so that's how you would set up the instinct level. Okay, so these are the, so the previous screen, this is where you would, these are the, basically the semaphores that you're going to um, load with those. So you can, each, each sensor, you can have nine different motor commands, right? <clears throat> um, so this is how you use it. Don't have to be a programmer to use that. <clears throat> So I put a little R in the front. It just means that you're going to use the set command because it's, it's a C store, right, versus a store. So the R just tells you that you want to use the set command, which is, which is C store. And um, so you just set up these things. And now the robot's going to, re going to have all these different behaviors based on whatever the problem is you're trying to solve. So I have some other words. <clears throat> Default instincts. Just loads all the registers with collision avoidance. Uh, all instincts. Maybe you want uh, if the ro you tell the ro uh, goal level says the robot go forward, and if it sees anything, you want to stop. So you can say, um, <clears throat> you know, st all instincts, and then it just sets everything to stop. Uh, you got save instincts. So <clears throat> um, you can save the instincts. Uh, or you can restore the instincts. So you might have a behavior that's doing collision avoidance, and then a behavior kicks in, and you want it to kill the thing. <laughs> you know, you want to change all the instincts around so that it's attacking the thing. So you do a save instincts first, and then you do a restore instincts when you want to go back to collision avoidance. <clears throat> Makes it really easy to make intelligent machines. Okay, so these are the registers that hold the values of the sensors. So I have an ADC that's, that's looking at the optical sensors. And so, uh, and there is a, um, there's a photo Darlington. And so basically we're getting an analog value and they're stored in these registers. And same thing with the right motor and the left motor. It's storing the actual current. So you have a lot of information about what's going on with this robot to create any kind of behavior you want. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> I have a word called display, and I made display smart. So, <clears throat> um, you know, this one is fetching an 8-bit value. But I also have 16-bit values, so display would know the difference um, between them and would display on the, the RS-232 terminal, you know. And so that way you just use display when you want to look at something. You don't have to, you know, see fetch or, or fetch, you know, or anything else. So display is kind of a smart word for that. <laughs> 
So here's an example of, <laughs> so V collided, V means it's a 16-bit value, right? We're going to be using fetch with that one. <clears throat> but if you use, if you said V collided display, collided display, display smart enough to know, to figure that out. So this is, uh, collided means any one of the instincts got set. So V collided value, that's really fetch or C fetch. Well, actually, that's a V, so that's going to be actually a fetch. But value does the same thing. You can use it on an 8-bit register or 16-bit. Um, if it's true, you're going to stop, else you're going to go forward, then it's fourth, right? So the kids were learning real, you know, real fourth programming. They didn't know it, but they were. Yeah, so these are some registers um, that basically, you know, uh, we saw something. So you can use any combination of these. Um, so here's an example, LF obstacle sensor, if right pivot then. So if this is, this is true, then it's going to do a right pivot. Now let's say you want to do, I have a word, uh, I have a, we, um, we didn't have, you know, our great compass chips in the day. I would have loved to have a compass chip on this robot. So I made a virtual compass. <laughs> uh, we're using pulse width modulation. So what I did was I basically counted, you know, because we're doing the ISR that's, that's generating the PWM. So I did the PWM in software. So I basically just had a register, I mean, a, a variable, where one side would be adding to the register and the other the PWM values and other sites subtracting. So it gave me a relative compass. And then I scaled it to 0 to 360. And so the kids, you know, it's a really crude compass. But if you have a compass, it's really great to servo on the compass for collision avoidance because then it's, you know, the robot goes like this, right? It's always trying to go that away. If, if an instinct makes it go off, to, off this way, and you're not telling it to servo on a comp compass, it's changed its direction. So I needed compass. <clears throat> so I made, I made one. Didn't have hardware. So here's some more. Um, <clears throat> so this is max speed was always set to be 100, but you could set it. Uh, every aspect of the system you pretty much can tweak. Um, our correction basically to make the robot go straight. So maybe, you know, you had to subtract, you know, three from the value, you know, on the PWM to make it go straight. Although this robot doesn't have to go that straight because it, remember, it's servoing on a goal. So in the day, everyone was using wheel encoders because they were trying to get precise. I said, screw that. You know, we want to go through that door over there. That's what's important. So the goal level should look at the door, and who cares if the robot goes on a perfectly straight line getting, getting to it? We want it to be smart, intelligent, and go over. <clears throat> um, this is uh, disables, enables stall detection. Um, there's our virtual compass. Uh, this is the maximum value for the compass. So here's some code on how you can use some of the, these things. <clears throat> so this is a registered, <clears throat> that turns the whiskers on and off, lights on and off, scents on and off. Um, you want to have a delay. Uh, so you notice when I held the wheel, it took a little bit before it reacted. So that's, that's what this delay is right here. <clears throat> um, and then you can turn the stall, basically motor stalls on and off. Um, this is how you calibrate the compass, this max compass. Um, so how you get the, you know, get the compass value. So, you know, people don't have to know C fetch or fetch. So value is smart. ST all instinct. So you can, 
Remember the, the nine motor commands? So all instincts, you can set them all to be the same if you want, using all instincts. <clears throat> so the, this is the, the multitasker. <clears throat> um, so I have a combination of preemptive multitasking plus cooperative multitasking. Behaviors, which are the if the situation exists, I'm going to do something, are cooperative to the goal level. They, when a behavior is executing, you'll notice that the song that it was singing, see, I, I just have it singing a song in the goal level. 90% of the CPU cycles are going to singing a song. It's doing collision avoidance with, you know, a few percent of the CPU bandwidth. So anyway, um, <clears throat> So these are the words, uh, add task, and so you create a fourth word, and then you just say add task, whatever your fourth word is. And then, like I talked about before, it would, um, you know, it's kind of like it would insert it into the task list. Uh, you can delete a task. Um, you can clear the task list. Priority is really important because <clears throat> you need to prioritize your tasks. Um, you need to think which one's more important like jumping off a cliff. If you had a, so with my robot, you could have a sense, you, you know, you can set it up where the robot refuses to jump off a cliff. You know, it, just, it won't do it. You know, the goal level says go forward. Nah, I ain't going to do it. <clears throat> um, so show tasks would dis display all the tasks. Uh, multitasking turns it on. You saw our instincts already. So here's some sample code. <clears throat> so I have a, a behavior called low battery. And you know when it monitors the battery level and it gets too low, you just have the thing stop and start crying, right? <laughs> um, so there's an example. Now, here I said one priority three times. So this is actually both whisker hit is going to be the first priority. This is going to be the second. This will be the third. Now, maybe you want it the other way around, but you can put one priority, two priority, three priority, right? And then it's the way you want it. I'm just kind of trying to explain that it inserts in the list. If if you if there's something already in that that uh, level of the list, <clears throat> you can delete a task. Now, all this stuff can can happen during a behavior. So. You could reload the task list to do something else and restore the task list back when the behavior terminates. So what we're doing here is we're not programming the robot. We're teaching it like a child. If you're in this situation, do this, you know, and that way we're making the robot make the decision, not the programmer. <clears throat> um, So here's some more source code. So, um, you know, variable is <clears throat> um, fourth word, and I create a, a new a new word called vhit. So now remember is c store store. It's a smart store, and then here's a here's a behavior uh, front front encounter. So a front obstacle sensor. If it's true, then we're going to do an F hit. We're going to increment that. So every time it gets a hit, so as long as it sees something, it's going to keep going higher and higher and higher. Um, so here I create another variable, both whisker hit, and zero both whisker hit now. So that's just setting it to zero. And so see how easy it is to make to program the robot? So this is actually two sensors, right? And then we just do an and, and then, and then we, it's a, just a simple if, if statement. <clears throat> uh, 
So here's an example. Obviously, there's some sort of, uh, fourth code in there. Um, the kids would do this this sort of stuff. So um, now they're learning about loops, right? Begin and question terminal until. So they know that if they press a key on the terminal, it's going to break, you know, break out of the loop. Um, so in the curriculum, which I'm going to, if we have time, I'll show you the curriculum. So that's basically how you program it. We're probably showing you enough of this. If people want my manual or the curriculum, I'm welcome to share it. So the, this is how uh, <clears throat> this is how I define low battery. So it gets the the low battery trigger level, and then this is the actual. I, I should have named that battery variable anyway. Um, but this is this is actual uh, fourth code, and so basically it does this stuff. You um, display so it's going to display the text screen. You know, it's dot quote right. <laughs> I was trying to make it more, as English as possible, but I really didn't redefine anything. If you wanted to use sort, uh, force, natural stuff like C patch and store, you, you know, you can do that, no problem. Okay, so that's kind of gives you an idea of the. Uh, I was going to go over the curriculum too. There we go. Okay, so this is the actual curriculum that we that I worked with uh, some teachers and put together. Um, so we just you know defining the different sensors on it, and I wanted to create. <clears throat> as close to an artificial creature as possible. Whiskers actually has a microphone and can digitize into an array the, the data. So we actually have a, a fine sound routine built into it. So it can actually pivot and listen. You'll see it make a 10 degree turn and all the lights turn off and it, it um, listens. And then it puts all these values in an array. And then it can, because of the compass, it can swing back and go to the, and find the sound which people like that. But I, try, I tried to give it as much um, of an animal, you know, um, characteristics as possible. So it, it sees, you know, we, we talked to the kids, you know, it, it sees with its four eyes. Um, it touches with its whiskers. It can feel its entire body using the, the monitoring the motor current. It can hear with the microphone. It can speak. It has um, all the, the ranges. <clears throat> um, I, I had a, a guy, any, you guys know Ken Butterfield, right? Ring a bell? He's a major fourth guy. <laughs> At least he was in the night. You remember Ken Butterfield from Los Alamos? You remember him? Okay. Ken Butterfield was in charge of the instrumentation group at Los Alamos. He was the number one guy. Every instrument that his group made custom for Los Alamos was written in fourth back in the early 90s. Every one. And he, he, was, he bought my robot. He was the second buyer of my robot. He saw it. He says, i got to have one of those. <laughs> and then he got it. And uh, he says, Don, I'd like to help you with this. I can actually, you know, I could rewrite some of your low-level. Because I wrote everything in high-level fourth. All the background tasks and everything. And it ran fine. He says, I can make it faster because I'll do it in assembler. Hey, no problem. And then he also was a musician. And so I had kind of hacked together the notes. And he says, oh, Don, that, that's bad. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so he went and made all the notes the right, the proper frequencies and everything. So um, let's see. So we try to give all the attributes of like a, an artificial animal. Um, so I just have some simple s stuff. Um, this is a table. <clears throat> so you can see the different. Uh, 
So this is something you could actually display, you know, on on the terminal screen. You just type in sensors and 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 enter, and it would display everything that's going on in the, at the instinct level. So here's their first test. Uh, 20 trigger factor, press enter. Uh, calibrate, press enter. Five trigger factor, press enter. And calibrate, press enter. So what this is doing, it's setting up, remember I talked about the, the hysteresis of the, of the LEDs? So it's setting up wider or tighter. So the tighter you make it, the further away he sees. But then he starts getting nervous because he's starting to get some random hits. It's not enough hysteresis. It's kind of funny. You, you set that, and he can sit there, and he's like a nervous. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the kids, you know, had a lot of fun with this. It was a cool, a cool robot that was intelligent, and they're writing simple programs and making it work. Uh, we actually got bumped by Logo later on in the decade, yeah. and their robots were stupid. <laughs> But, you know, <clears throat> what can I say? Oh, originally it was to draw stuff, but that's what um, uh, Legos used. Right. Yeah. So we got bumped by Legos, which, they, what are the kids? They're playing with blocks, and, and they're making a robot. They're basically doing basic, real simple programming. You know, this they're working with an artificial creature. You know, they thought this was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, and they were learning about the future of robotics. You know, we're going to have intelligent robots, which we have pretty smart robots today. So how did, uh, have you built any, uh, like, memory into this? Meaning that you can put in No, it's stupid. No, 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 I know it is, but... Maybe, maybe the new one isn't, but... The new but one is basically map the entire house, right? So, literally... And how many years did it take that? <laughs> you know, it's just another data point that, you know, everybody knows who has a Roomba, they, that they know exactly what the layout of the house looks like, you know, you know what's, you know, in all the obstacles that are in there, but... It is stupid, but it uses that mapping technology to, uh, you know, carry out its operation. So, and basically the goal is to clean every surface within that grid. I'm going to tell you a funny story. So, yeah, um, I mean, to me, I am so underwhelmed by the Roomba, but they sold millions of them. They made money. I didn't, I'm not rich. So obviously, who's smarter? <laughs> but I, I, funny story. So uh, I get whiskers going, and I go, is there something I can make this thing do that's actually useful? And I get this Black & Decker 12-volt vacuum for a car. And I mount it on the tail. You know, put a little pivot point on it, and I let it run around. And I go, "That's that, that's not any good." <laughs> I did that, which is what the Roomba did when it first came out. I did that in like '93 or '94, and I said, "I said, you know, I really need to do a good job. I need to have a compass, or I need some way to make it go like this." Anyway. What, kind of what happens when engineers look at stuff sometimes. You know, marketeers look at that and say, oh, it's, it's fun. People love it. So uh, when, when, it, <clears throat> when Whiskers boots up, obviously, okay, you know, that's familiar. They're in fourth. You know, they can, do, they can play with all the fourth was there. They're, we didn't limit it, any access to fourth. So it was pretty powerful, really. And <clears throat> so we had them. Um, these are the words they're going to learn the, this next uh, next thing. So they're going to learn these words, um, and then step by step, 
type in forward, enter, and they, they have it on books, and the wheels go forward. So they're learning the words in the beginning here that they have available for programming. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so reverse direction actually basically reverses whatever direction it's going. So it's going forward, it go backwards. If it's doing a left pivot, it do a right pivot. What it just inverts the bits to the motor mask, basically. So they're learning this stuff, <clears throat> and they type forward three th three seconds stop. We also have feet, you know, forward one foot. It was, you know, it's not a perfect foot, but. Um, but that's, you know, how we want to talk to our robots, right? So here's the first exercise. They type in default instincts, which means collision avoidance. They type forward, and they put the robot on the ground, and it does collision avoidance. So, you know, that's the very first task that they're doing. So it kind of gets them excited about working with the robot. Exactly. So put them on the books again. So here's the second one, teaching whiskers new words. <laughs> that looks familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> yep. So they're learning fourth. The very, se the very second. So each one of these is designed for an hour. So this is hour two. They're learning how to define words in fourth. And so they're learning some new words that Whiskers knows. Uh, remember, um, so Whiskers has uh, the entire code fits on a 32K PROM, but we have 32K of battery backed up RAM. And I literally <laughs> use the battery. So when you turn the robot off, it's battery backing the RAM. So I always tell the users to leave it plugged in because it's consuming power even when it's off. But what Remember does <clears throat> is Anything you downloaded to the robot, if you say remember and turn it off, you turn it on again, it's back in the same state. All the words that you taught it, you know, it remembers it, right? I don't, I don't think we did. But if you typed in fourth, it would say, you know, new micros. <laughs> Um, like go forth? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, didn't, you never mentioned the word forth. You just said um, You know, that was during the time when forth and C were competing for embedded systems. Yeah. And um, I didn't want to get in the battle, the war, necessarily. Yeah. I tell you the truth, I didn't really think about it too much. Yeah. Um, I was trying to promote that it was English. You know, an English syntax. Yeah, I, I, I'm a C programmer. I make a living, unfortunately. But I mean, no, fortunately for the living, but unfortunately for the language. So then they learn about words, right? And they see the words that he knows. So they're learning forth. <clears throat> um, so I'm teaching him the basics of defining. Uh, you know, using forth to define a new word. So they define this word. They type in words, and look, oh boy, there's move at the top. You know, it's all forth. And then they type in move, enter, and then they see it going. Wow, that's cool. You know, I just programmed the robot. But you know what? They tell it to go forward with the instincts on, and just click and avoid automatically. You know, did Logo do that? I mean, um, Lego? Nope. Oh, yeah, they, they pushed us out towards the end of the 90s. <clears throat> so we're teaching them different things like that. Um, okay, so I taught them the fourth word forget, forget move. So I, at least I helped a little bit. I exposed, uh, you know, maybe 200,000 kids to fourth. So we, we have acceleration and deacceleration words. And so they learn that next. 
ramp up and ramp down. You give it the rate and the speed. It's fourth. You got to give it the parameters first. <laughs> um, so they learn all the different motor uh, commands. And then, um, so they're experimenting with that. So this is getting them, you know, familiar with uh, the language. And you'll notice I kept it as English-like as possible. There they go programming again. Well, they're defining test one and test two and test three. And you'll notice that test three is calling test one and test two, so they're learning about that. That's the first three tasks. In three hours, they got that far learning fourth, learning programming in three hours. So this is the fourth one. <clears throat> so now we're going to play around with the compass. So these are the compass words. Okay, so <clears throat> remember trigger factor is sets all, all the, at the same value. So we're going to define a word called blind and basically make it so far that, you know, whiskers is blind, he can't see. Um, then we define a word called avoid, real simple, and you type in blind, and now we're going to play around with pivoting. Here again, we got some, some more, so I said, you know, <clears throat> I mean, with fourth, you know, you, one letter is a word, right? So you want to just do L and R on the keyboard? So they show them how to do that. You see there's a remember at the bottom, so when they turn the robot off, it will remember those words. <clears throat> so we're playing around with the pivots command uh, and this task. So they're adjusting for turns. Let's see. I kind of go... So... <clears throat> the. So now they they need to write a program to make whiskers because they've learned enough now to go out. It's called I wanted I want them to call it get coke. So it goes out, does a 180 and comes back, and that's their test. <laughs> so they're they're fourth programmers. Everybody took this this course. <laughs> okay, pivots and turns. So we're going to learn those words now. That's these guys. And at the end of all this, every single task, they have to write a uh, code. So these are all the different pivot words. So now, now they have to make whiskers go in a square. They know enough to do it now. So we just keep, now that's five hours programming. And they've gotten that far. Then uh, whiskers can do arcs, obviously, because he can, you know, he has um, from one to a hundred in the speed of each motor, so he can do arcs and circles and stuff like that. So they're going to learn that next. <clears throat> um, so I have some words for saving different conditions and restoring, like the speed. So you might have a behavior that's going to change the speeds around. So you save the speeds before when you start the behavior do whatever you want to do and then restore. That way, whatever the goal level had set it at, it's going to return. That, that's the point of a behavior is, um, you know, it takes control, deals with a the problem, then returns control to the goal level. <clears throat> so they learn all that good stuff and see what their problem is. So now they have to do a figure eight. So they have to program that. <clears throat> and sound effects. So these are some different um, sounds that I programmed into the robot. And they sound, when you heard him running around, you heard some kind of different sounds. So these are some of the ones I have. Laser was one of the ones you heard. Um, you can do it. it even has a bird call <laughs> sound. Uh, has a warble and a whale. Um, these are all different 
<clears throat> sounds that are defined. So then they, they test that out. Bird call. It has a little bird in there. So 404 bird calls. So it'd be like <clears throat> 400 is kind of the frequency range, and then 4 is the number of times it does it, you know, kind of like a, a bird, right? Bit a lot in 32K of <laughs> code. Okay, so now they're gonna <clears throat> they're gonna define a word called sound off, and they're gonna use the sound to make the box. So they're gonna give it a direction, and then they're gonna use the sound. And that's the distance because when it's when it's making a sound, of course, the processor's that's all it's doing, except for the background task. <clears throat> and uh, so that way, you, a leg of the squares could be one sound, another leg a different sound, and then... so now we're on eight. So Whiskers knows <clears throat> um, all these different notes. Hey, there's fourth. I guess I did have it in there. <laughs> oh, I was a good boy. I did put it in there. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, I call it vocabulary, right? Yeah, vocabulary, so. Is this a tutorial collection? Is that available on? Uh, I'll make it available. I have PDF. Um, the, the email about the meeting, the same one. Because I actually sent. I sent. Okay. Okay. I, yeah, I have to check to make sure I have your personal email. I I sent you. Hey, I just turned 65. You want me to remember something? No. You're just creating. They will take you to the agenda page, and my email address is on the agenda page. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so, actually, so thanks to Dr. Kenneth Butterfield, you know, uh, the music is correct. <laughs> So we have one eighth notes, quarter notes, three eighths, one half. I wouldn't know one if I fell over it, so that's all him. I'm not a musician. So um, so here's some. I relied on him heavily for this one. <laughs> thought of this problem. Uh, you remember the DARPA Grand Challenge? Okay, I went to the I went to all of them. I went to the first one and I was in the pit area. And so you know I'm thinking about this, right, and how to apply it for that problem. And so I need the goal level, I need GPS running. And I also need some sort of vision system to 
to see the road. Other than that, you know, um, pretty much the Triune OS would work really well. So, guideless up the back. There's 20 blade servers in it. 20. I'm just shaking my head. I'm going, really? <laughs> you know, to make an autonomous vehicle, you know, and it's off-road, no less. You know, and they can use GPS. Anyway, um, yeah, intelligent machines with this, you know, we could make them way cheaper and I, I would say way smaller smarter. So to answer your question is, <clears throat> I'm thinking of a Whiskers 2. Um, you notice I would never make this board again. You know, this is all through hole components. <laughs> so I want to redesign it. Um, what my vision on Whiskers 2 is, is it's going to be really small. Like a, it's going to sit under a, a five inch square photo, um, photovoltaic. And w Whiskers 2 will get hungry and it will go search for where the brightest sunlight is. So it'll make some noises that it's not happy and it will go off and it will find the brightest window and it will sit there for a few hours. When it comes back, it'll be all happy and, and then it would have a PRR sensor, you know, to find people and want to go play. So um, <clears throat> I do want to, you know, continue on with this. Um, I started a company called Solar Power Corp because uh, I really believe solar energy is the way to go and I want to help in that endeavor. Um, but I want to get Solar Power Corp, Corp going and making money and then I'll spend the rest of my life in robotics. But, you know, right now the barrier to entry, you know, with iRobot and all the, everybody else, Boston Robotics. I mean, they're making some pretty incredible stuff. It's really expensive, really pricey. But um, so, you know, back when I was doing it, uh, it was really new. And I was hoping to get a foothold, but the recession of 2000, and then you had the 9-11 attacks, and uh, I, I couldn't get a foothold, and I had to go get a job. I had to shut down and just research. Very sad day. <laughs> To manufacture to sell. Um, what I sold them for? Manufacture. Well, it's expensive. Uh, back in the day, I paid sixteen dollars for the motors. There's two of those. Um, the pro new micros charged me forty-four dollars for their processor, which you know now we what a two-dollar processor run uh, flat flash forth. So um, I had to sell it for like seven, eight. It was actually eight hundred dollars. Um, to these people in the education market. You know, you have to have a four times margin to pay for overhead and employees and, and you know, at the end of the day, make, make a profit. So um, with today's technology, you know, we can make intelligent machines a lot cheaper. I could make Whiskers 2 and sell it for maybe $200, you know, 195 the physics, I mean, the, the, the basic components of it, the motors, uh, the battery, and all these things, uh, these are not... They're, not, uh, they're cheap they're, now. They're cheaper, but they're still cost. Uh, actually, I have a parts kit on my... Microprocessors, <laughs> they are nothing now. I have a parts kit. Yeah, are we getting close? Well, you're only about 15 minutes past, so... Oh, I am? Okay. You want to cut it here? Well... Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can continue next week as well. Or next month. Let me just show you one quick little. Is anybody desperate to see this one? Yes, yes, yes. Let's see it. See what? What? Wrap it up. In the next 15 minutes, okay. then we're going to call it in the meeting, and we're going to do vacation pictures next month. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Um. Yeah, like the uh, talk from Maker Faire. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the, the only port we're going to have next month is Chuck. Oh, shit.
So this is a short Yeah, it's a beef, very beefy motor, and there's uh, four of them. There's one drive in each wheel, and then there's a controller we built. Um, this robot would go a mile, <clears throat> and no, this is an uh, intruder. So, a funny, uh, while this is running, I'll tell you a funny story. So, <clears throat> um, I was actually in ver a very good position, I thought, at the, at the time, because because I associated with Blitch. Blitch went to Congress in 99, got $50 million to, to pursue this program. He became the manager of TMR, Tactical Mobile Robots, for DARPA. And he invited me to what is called the inter interim performance reviews and actually paid for a plane flight and stuff. <clears throat> um, and I was working with an outfit called... Uh, what's the name of it? Um, I'll think of it. Anyway, it was um, a government research facility and um, Southwest Technical Research. And they put together a, uh, um, a robotics test yard. And they actually flew me out, paid me as a consultant to review it. And uh, I said, yeah, that's, you guys did a great job. Anyway, they called me up one day and said, uh, we want to order an intruder. And how much is it? 25 grand. And it cost me $2,500, I think, to make it. Wish I could have sold more. Anyway, uh, okay. Took the PO, shipped him off the robot. <clears throat> Call me back, say, okay, we want you to come out. We, we want you to train uh, some of our people to use it. We're going to pay for your airfare and everything else. Great. Fly out there. Introduce me to this guy. And uh, so I'm teaching, like, three people how to use the the unit. It works in grass and snow and um, I could actually make a version that would actually float on top of the water. <clears throat> um, so I taught these guys how to use it and everything. Last night uh, with this, this one new guy I hadn't seen before says, hey, you want to have dinner? Yeah, sure. So we have dinner and he says, uh, Don, we're going to use your robot on a real mission. I'm with the CIA. <laughs> and he said, I can't tell you a, a lot about it, but there's going to be a chain link fence, and we're going to mount some, something on your robot. It's going to pro protrude through the fence and sample some water. And that's the last I heard. So it was used by the CIA once. <laughs> All right. Anyway, and just. <clears throat> I like that one. Uh, ridge. It goes over pretty much all terrain. Yeah. Without getting, uh, you know, clogged or clumped. You know, the only thing I didn't see is, you know, maybe uh, mud. I can see it going, floating on water or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if the cylinders were uh, empty, right? So it had some buoyancy. And those with, are your standard paddle type uh, arrangements, like they have in paddle boats. So, so with, with mud, there is so little of the non-moving surface exposed and so much of the moving surface exposed, it would plow through mud. Um, you saw how big the motors were. They, they, were, over, they were actually overkill. So um, <clears throat> one of those motors could probably run that robot, but I had four of them. So I can, <clears throat> you want to hear more about this stuff, we can talk next meeting. Are you guys interested in having me talk at fourth day? Yeah, it's always about fourth. <laughs> Okay, what, what, I'll, what I'll do is, my, my passion is AI. To me, this is just the start. Um, I got some people that are, um, <clears throat> I've known for a while that, that want to team up with me. Because this is a bigger nut than, I mean, maybe some of you guys might be interested. But um, I want to build, 
you know, we need to put AI. This is this is just the mobility piece of the robot. I want to put AI on top of it and um, and do some real stuff. Real stuff. All right. Yeah. You're assuming AI is real. <laughs> well, I'm kind of impressed. <laughs> It's, it's getting more real every day. Yes, yes. <laughs> for the last 50 years. Yeah, but this last five has been accelerating. Correct, correct. So I don't know if you noticed, but uh, on the Watson site, you can actually get an API for Watson. Correct. For free. Correct. For free. For free. Yes. For free. Well, see, I know. I played with it. That is. Yeah? I would love to hear what you did with it. Nothing. Which is why they like giving so it free. Which is why it's, free. So it's no different than you know, uh, all the Google pictures and stuff, you know? Because uh -huh. they, when you put them together, they're going to be able to make a Great. That, that model works for me. So, it, so Whiskers 2 will have Wi-Fi on it, so you guys can program it remotely. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, now, do you have like a, uh, a remote thing to do, um, so all your controls and updating and all that can be measured, you know, real-time? Well, uh, during the day, we used, I used some very high-end uh, serial modems that went a mile. That's how I did remote control. Back in that, back then. <clears throat> so Whiskers 2 would have a Wi-Fi chip on it and have a real compass on it. And it would have um, a solar cell for feeding itself. So it would be an internal robot. And, you know, the idea would be to create really cool behaviors that would blow people away, right? You saw how simple the behaviors were. They used hardly any memory space. In, in you know the processor we put in there today, we put 64k in there, and I don't, I can't imagine an application that would use that much. <laughs> well, as, as long as you're not building one of those military robots that basically uh, ingest data, right? Oh yes, yeah. carbonize them and use them as fuel. Right. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, recently we have uh, have not uh, been able to get to uh, this year. Uh, yeah, we, got we didn't it. get to get it. But uh, would you be inclined to uh, run the uh, Baker's Fair if you can get that food? Ah, sure. This year, more making. Next May. May. When is it? Next, next year in May. Next May. Yeah, as long as I still have my job in May. Well, actually, I could probably just come up, too. Yeah. Wait, is it going to uh, weekend? Yeah. Oh, by the yeah. way, if, if we do get a booth, there's uh, people that are attending, I guess, if it passes. So, uh, you know, we'll have to Yeah, yeah, sign me up. I'll do it, uh, even if... You have to do the application in, in January. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll man the booth. I'll help you out. This, Good night, folks. <laughs> this concludes the meeting. <laughs> See you next one. Thank you.